Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the quick break and uh, managed to get a cup of tea or a coffee at least. Now, our next panel discussion is about maximizing value, public procurement basics. That's what we're looking at. As we know, procurement is an important driver of innovation, offering the opportunity to transform industry, delivery of public services and communities across the country. And as we've been hearing already, it is vital to building back better. The Green Paper says the current process creates high entry costs, which is a fundamental barrier to supporting innovation. So how do we maximize value in procurement? Well, thankfully, we have a panel who are going to discuss this with us today, and they are Michael Pace, who is the Managing Director at NHS London Procurement Partnership, and Dirk van der Waard, who is from Consultation, who is rather the Consultation and Engagement Manager, Cornwall Council. So for now, Michael and Dirk, thank you both, and welcome to our panel discussion today. Um, we, we did this with the first panel. It's probably a nice way of hearing a little bit more about both of you, but tell us in a couple of sentences what you actually do. Michael, let's start with you. So um, I'm the managing director of a um, NHS hub. Um, we look after the region of London. Uh, we've got four main category expertise that we look after in workforce, estates, uh, digital and uh, pharmacy. Uh, and uh, we try to work with all the trusts across London and get them to, to collaborate and uh, move forward on, on those particular areas. OK, so so working with uh, several trusts from what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. great. Uh, and uh, what about yourself? What, tell us a little bit more about your role. What is involved? So my role as a consultation and engagement manager is to um, advise our, our managers and counsellors on, on how to engage residents and service users in development of policies, services, major projects. Um, but it's also about building the, the capacity to, to help become um, a, a listening council that, that works together with its communities. It would okay. be a unitary authority covering a large area. So maintaining that connection between residents and the council um, okay. is very important. Well, hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about uh, how that work actually translates into what happens um, in practice very shortly. But for now, thank you both um, for giving us that little bit of an introduction. And let me just remind the audience that if you have any questions that you would like to put throughout this uh, discussion, uh, then please use the live chat function and uh, we'll get some of those questions to either Michael uh, or Dirk or indeed both of them. Uh, during the next half hour or so. So um, let's let's start with our discussion then, please, gentlemen. And, and certainly, uh, Michael, in terms of where we are today and uh, what the future looks like for procurement, what, in your opinion, are going to be the key things to focus on to deliver the value that we need? And so, that's what, obviously, we've been hearing so much about today. Yes, I think, I think there's a couple of things. Um, so I think, first of all, um, the sustainability and social value is, is a big thing on, on the agenda. Uh, and I think it's looking at how we work in those particular areas. Um, initially, when you start to look at those sorts of things, people see lots of more costs coming through the, the system. Um, but I think technology has moved forward quite a lot uh, and things are starting to, to change. And, you know, it's up to us to sort of work with our suppliers to understand how we bring some of those uh, innovations in the sustainability world and, and social value. Um, some of it is not all short-term gain. There is more. There is more long-term gains uh, in in that. Um, so I think that's an important part to look at first of all. Uh, I think the second part is about collaboration. Um, the NHS has been in a in a situation for a number of years where it's been in a, a forced position of competing with itself uh, and with trusts across each other. Those barriers have been broken down now for us and it's much easier for us to, to collaborate and the NHS is starting to, to collaborate much more and we're seeing how we can build efficiencies uh, in that and how we can change the way that we go to market. And I think the third element then is actually working with the suppliers uh, instead of sort of trying to drive them down a, a commodity route uh, is actually look at how we work with them, how we develop with them uh, and how we look to bring the, the innovations that will create the, the efficiencies that we want because to continue just trying to sort of beat suppliers up all the time. You know, we may save a penny here and a penny there, but we're not going to make the fundamental changes that, that we need to make to get to the efficiencies and get the savings that we're being expected to, to deliver. 
Yeah, uh, and and they are considerable, aren't they? That that's the key there. Um, uh, do, what does procurement mean to you? And, and certainly, when you're looking at your role, how does that actually translate? Yeah, I, I, I must admit, I, I feel uh, a bit like the one out here in this uh, sort of uh, amongst all these procurement experts. Um, but, but actually, consultation and engagement is a, is an area that has seen a lot of change recently. Um, engaging people in some meaningful discussions about the future of services or, or local areas that has traditionally been done face to face. Um, uh, with online engagement being something that was sort of nice to have at best. Um, uh, but the pan pandemic has been a, a real game changer a, because it sort of forced us to get much more serious about online engagement capabilities, um, but B, because a large part of the population actually got used to online meetings, you know, yes. including uh, uh, you know me, myself and my, my colleagues. Um, so doing more things online. Um, and, and that's not going to change now that we're, you know, able to start being able to to, to meet face to face again. Uh, we'll definitely want to go out and meet people again, uh, but online engagement will be part of the mix um, because we've learned if we do that right, we can reach more people, uh, including those that that wouldn't dream of giving up their evening to attend a, a public meeting in a in a, in a town hall. Um, so in terms of what you know, what I procure, not not too long ago, I would mostly be procuring post-it notes and flip chart sheets. Um, but now I'm, I'm I'm looking for you know the best online engagement platforms, online meeting software, other virtual communications tools that that can help bring projects to life and enable meaningful feedback. Um, and, and that's a, a, a rapidly evolving market. I know you said um, perhaps you, you didn't feel you were in the same boat as, as some of the uh, procurement uh, professionals we have today, but it is a very valid contribution, isn't it? Hearing exactly what the public uh, want to say and, and want to speak about, because that's driving a lot of this change. Uh, yes, and um, um, you know, that can often be forget forgotten. Um, so you know, we're, we're obviously yeah. procuring things with the with the, or we should be procuring things with the direct service user in mind um and but we're under under you know tremendous financial pressure like that goes to the nhs that goes to local councils um and and then the, there is a, a sort of a, perhaps a tendency to to focus on short-term fixes um rather than look at, at at longer term solutions that actually work for residents so we, we we focus on what's going to work for our service in the short term rather than on what's going to you know uh, provide the most most value um. and I know um, Michael you've spoken about being strategic and the fact that we need to be more strategic um, what what do you actually mean um, in this particular scenario when it comes to procurement I think you know for, for a long time procurement has been seen as just getting the, the purchase order done for you know whatever is is needed um, I think you know we've got a lot of skills um, in what we can bring, and it's about getting further up the chain and actually starting to to talk about well, what is the the service or the product that you want? How's that going to be delivered? What is the outcomes that you actually need from that? And I think if we can get involved in those conversations, we can look at how we get a much better outcome uh, on there. Um, and one of the things that we've started looking at with, across my team is although we're sort of one step removed from from the front line, our services do impact on how the patient journey goes through the through the hospital uh, and I think it's really important that we start to understand that not just the bit where the patient gets treated but the, the whole process right from primary care through to to aftercare and then how do we sort of bring the procurement along on that journey uh, and so when the when the interventions happen with the patient you know um, you get the you get the best that we can get for for that patient so if you know if I take the workforce side We've got hundreds of vacancies, thousands of vacancies in, in the NHS. You know, if we can do that better, we can get, you know, better trained staff into the places where the patient's going to be needed them, you know, on the states. You know, if you're walking into a hospital and the paint's peeling off the back of the reception, you're not going to get a good feeling about the treatment that you're going in there. So, you know, if we can be part of that that journey uh, and then put the right services in at the right places, uh, hopefully we we support in that patient journey and, and give the patient a better experience and a better outcome. So what's stopping that happening now? What are the, what are the main challenges? Um, finances is 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 one of them. 
Um, it is very difficult. Um, there is still a bit of short-termism going on. It's where well, you've got the budget for this year and you've got to get that, that spent. And there's lots of pressure on that budget about what, what it does. Um, I think we, we haven't been the best customer to, to our suppliers uh, in some of the things that we've done and the way that we've approached our suppliers. And, it, and it's allowed them to sort of have multiple contracts where we could have less contracts uh, and we've not given the opportunity to um, look at where we can build efficiencies with them uh, and drive you know better better costs with uh, with that you know it's it's not uncommon for for some of the bigger suppliers to have hundreds of different contracts with the NHS for for the same thing and and across those contracts you would have different variances on there um you know if we're really going to come together as the NHS well why don't we go to these big suppliers and, and talk to them as the NHS rather than individual trusts um so I think there's a lot of things we can do uh but I think the good news is, is that we are starting to do that and we're doing that in pockets of, of areas. So, you know, I know in my region in, in London, uh, we are coming together, we are talking as a as a region uh, and we are working out how do we sort of take that next step and, and uh, talk to, to uh, suppliers uh, and, you know, share things across ourselves as well. Okay. Well, and I'm guessing it's a slow process, isn't it, from, from what you're saying and takes uh, a lot more time. Um, what are the challenges you find when navigating the procurement process? What, what sort of things are you coming up against? I guess my, my perspective, I guess, is that of your sort of basic middle manager within a large um, organisation, local government in, in my case, and, and but, but trying to um, introduce an innovation uh, to, to procure something that will actually enable a different way of, of working. Um, and, and there are lots of balls to, to juggle there. Um, you know, uh, most of my colleagues, the word procurement fills them with, with dread. It, it means a long, drawn-out uh, uh, process. Um, first of all, you, you need to spend a lot of time understanding what it is that you need. You need to yes. then match that with what is out there on the market. Uh, and alongside that, there's the, the challenge of, of actually getting the approval to proceed to procurement, to, to get that purchase order number. That's, uh, that can be uh, like wading through, through treacle to get you know all the all the ducks in a row um, um now i think as for that sort of market orientation and understanding what's right for you for your organization um i, I think we could be smarter as a sector as well michael's been talking about you know um uh, working collaboration on on that yeah. within the sector um i i think we could do more about that as as local authorities um you know we all provide the similar types of services um, but it often feels that we're we're sort of in our in our silos, sort of reinventing the wheel in isolation. Um, and you know, our method is sort of we you call on early adopters and other authorities, ask them what they did, what they learned, um, and that's obviously helpful. But it yeah. can also be a bit hit and miss. So, so a similar question, really, then to Michael: What's not happening now that perhaps could alleviate that situation? Why why is it still carrying on? Um, I think um, I'll probably answer that in a in a slightly different different way. In terms that you have got to remember that you know for the last twenty years the NHS has you know been competing with each other. So as as procurement professionals, you know we've not shared things and and we've tried to sort of outdo each other if you, if you like in terms of where we've been going. So we're trying to undo twenty years of of competition to look at how we collaborate, uh, and we've started that journey now and we are talking on that journey. But we've, there's lots of things that we've still got to, to unpick. You know, uh, a lot of things that we do, we, we put contracts in for, for, for four years. It's not easy just to say, right, I'm not going to do that anymore, especially if you've got commitment uh, into that. Um, but we are looking now at, at the ways that we can improve that and change that for, for the future. OK. Um, and what about inflation then? How, how are you dealing with a rise in inflation where we had record figures yesterday announced, you know, a cost of living crisis is one of those terms sadly we're all becoming so familiar with uh, and this is a question to both of you really so so um michael I, I know i addressed it to you but dirk i'd like to hear your thoughts on this too please about how you're dealing with that rise in inflation and and the impact it has on everybody's life do you want me to go first samina yeah either yeah. yep that's fine <laughs> we'll, we'll um, hear from both of you yes yeah, so um yeah, i mean look it's 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 a big challenge um, you know, thrown on top of everything else. Um, again, I think it's, you know, again, got to question the way that we've bought things in the past uh, and how do we buy things in, in the future. 
uh, and it's about working with our suppliers, um, you know, and, and, you know, are we, are we putting the right specifications together? You know, can we change the specifications? Can we build those efficiencies? How do we start to overcome some of those inflation pressures? Are we artificially creating some of those because of the way that we've, we've bought in the past? So I think it's about unpicking some of them, first of all, uh, and then really challenging ourselves about, you know, how, how we want to go forward in the, in the future as well. It's, it is a mindset change as well, isn't it? As yeah. you're saying, yeah. Uh, Dirk, what about for you? I mean, how are you dealing with that when it comes to the procurement process? Well, um, you know, as for uh, for for every organisation, business um, uh, in in the country at the moment, um, you know, rising costs come on top of, um, of, of existing financial pressures to to achieve efficiency. So it's a sort of double whammy, um, and um, I suppose from the from the public's perspective, and uh, the, the the pressure from them on on. The public sector to be even more efficient in how it spends its money is increasing as well because um, you know we keep having to go back every year to ask them to pay more council tax in, in my case um and uh, with the public rightly asking what are we getting for that money and are you spending it well and, and you know talking about some you know procurement in, in that in this context and how that's, uh, that's sort of relevant um you know public basically expect um, us to to look after their taxes and being efficient, ensuring value for money in everything we do. Um, but the only time we're in the news is, or procurement is in the news is when things are wrong. You know, when money is wasted on, on products that don't work, contracts awarded to you know friends or family members, um, and that kind of stuff, um, and that undermines public trust. And the side effect is is that it then becomes harder to engage people. So. Um, but yeah, cost pressures are high. Inflation is is everywhere, um, and I think that the risk of that is that you the focus becomes even more on the financial value rather than on sort of maximising the value you can achieve through through procurement. It goes back to short term fixes versus long term solutions. Yeah. And perhaps I'm picking um, and going right back to bases, uh, as Michael was indicating. I, I know you mentioned there about the news and, and only being in the news for bad news stories, I guess. But uh, it, can you give us an example of a good news story that perhaps we, we, I say, the media didn't cover that could have covered? You know, that the, these are always interesting to hear because it, it sort of says us, tells a story that perhaps we need to know about, but we, we just missed. No, when when procurement goes right and you and, and you know and, and you, you know everything comes together and you, you buy the right the right prices there is no news it, it, because it, it is all seamless and uh, and everybody um you know just is, is happy with the service they're receiving but there isn't a glorious moment where you know um, you can say oh we've really done a good deal here um you know it, it i don't i don't think you can easily create good good news stories uh, uh, about that but, um, but you, when you know, do, you risk, of course, things coming down later on. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, don't you, as an organisation, that that worked, um, and that was a good deal, and that certainly worked for the end user. It certainly worked along the way, and and you, it's something perhaps that you would repeat. Sometimes it, it takes a few years for for the rewards really to materialise, um, and you you know you often have to go through 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 pain. To, to get um, to the to the right end result, um, and you know that that's that's sort of part of the, the problem. You look at the here and now. You might think of a particular project as being, you know, behind financially, costing more than than was anticipated. But in in three years' time, you're actually seeing the benefits. Uh, but we don't often look back over that sort of long longer periods of time to say, yeah, we did make the right decision three four years ago. Which, which is a shame, really, isn't it? Perhaps, perhaps we need a little bit more of that. Yeah, I think that's the marketing department, anyway, Dirk. So, so we're okay there. Um, we, we, the reason I was asking more about that and pushing a little bit on it is because we are talking about maximising value uh, within the public procurement basics, and 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 that is what our discussion is today. Um, and I just wondered um, about maximising value as a as a term uh, and what it actually means in the round to you and your organization so so michael what is it for you 
So I think just to sort of pick up on, on, on both bits, I, I suppose, one of the things that uh, we've done there is um, <clears throat> there's government policy that's come out and said that anything we, we buy in, in the NHS now has to have a 10 percent weighting on social value. Um, that had the, the potential to create huge amounts of administration for, for the NHS. And what we've been able to do in London is, is to look at a, a tool and we've procured a tool that the whole of London is now using to, to manage that element of it uh, and actually what it's starting to do is actually drive more collaboration uh, across the organizations because we're putting everything on there and we're seeing what everybody's doing now and it's, it's really opening up those conversations i suppose using tools like that and the development of, of tools like that and where you can sort of maximize not just use it in, in one organization but in several organizations you can start to then maximize value because you can start to share data share information much easier uh, and look at how you then build your pipelines and then move forward. Right. So, so that's obviously is that an online tool? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so that's shared easily as well, uh, yeah. and, and it can yeah. be rolled out to other trusts throughout the country. It, it could be. Yeah. I mean, we're we're piloting it in London at the minute, and uh, we've got every London trust uh, up and running. Or we're in the throes of implementing every trust on there. But it's it's also an access for suppliers because suppliers have to go in there and. And constantly update what, what they're doing so if we're held accountable we can say we can pull the information down so it's, it's creating that interaction with suppliers as well for us okay um and and Dirk, what about for you maximizing value what what does that mean well I, so first of all it, it, it so that means public value in its in its wider sense and not just financial value or a lot of that is that's very important um, but you can focus too much on the on the price tag and, and forget about the things that are that are really going to add value to uh, to residents or, or, or your organization um, and, and Mike talked about social value and that's a very useful uh, sort of concept uh, but, it, but it goes beyond that um, and I guess my, my bugbear is really about this sort of service silos and organizational silos and overcoming those uh, you know, moving from short-term fixes to and that short-term fixes that work for individual services but to procuring procuring much sort of longer term solutions that work um, for residents I'll, I'll give you an example of what i mean so imagine me as a, a, a you know local resident wanting to interact with my with my council and and let's imagine for a, a second that i'm in a unitary area so i only have a single single council to 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 deal with yeah. so say I want to comment on a, on a planning application in my in my neighbourhood. Um, um, I also want to comment on the plans for the future of the town centre. Um, I want to renew and pay for my garden waste collection, um, and there happens to be a pothole uh, in the road near my house, and I want to report it. Now, there's, there's a good chance I can do all this online now, you know, which is you know great. Uh, there's also a very good chance that those four interactions with my local council will require me to use four different systems uh, yeah. some of which will require me to go through the registration process first use a name and password and all that sort of stuff so not the greatest customer experience however there's also a very good chance that each of the services that i'm trying to contact feel that they have procured a very efficient and customer friendly online portal uh, for their service so for, for me, maximizing value is, is about building into the process incentives to look from the outset for the potential benefits beyond fixing the immediately immediate problem at hand. Uh, I think that's a very graphic and good example, because I think lots of us may be listening and thinking, yes, we've been through that experience, maybe not four, but certainly had to log on a couple of times to get something done. Um, and, and it's interesting you say it can all probably happen online now because I guess a lot of people are still used to thinking I'll ring up and have a chat with somebody and of course you're, you're saying online is perhaps the better way. We, we've actually had a comment so just bear with me, um, I'm just going to read it out to you. Um, and it's uh, from Adam, who says, I think if we had more case studies on positive social value that could be reported on both locally and nationally uh, well-known media, then this would really maximise value, also help suppliers and organisations understand what can be achieved via social value. So very similar to what you were saying. Um, I don't know if you want to, to add on that. I mean, the, it is about letting people know, isn't it, about 
what is working. Well, I, I know necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a good news story, but within the organisation, perhaps that collaboration aspect would be useful, certainly. And, and I know you've, you've spoken about this. Do you think the NHS is ready to collaborate, uh, Michael? Is it, is, you know, it's such a big organisation. Is it, is it even physically possible? Um, I think it's got to. Uh, I don't think it's a question of whether it's ready ready or not. Um, like I said, there are pockets of collaboration starting to happen already. Uh, and I think we've got to look at how we expand that and, and take that even further forward. Um, in, in terms of case studies around social value, there's social value is, is a relatively new thing uh, in terms of what we're doing. Social value has been around for years and years and years, but the, the focus on it is relatively new. Uh, and there are some really, really good things happening. Uh, I think just to, to, to Dirk's point earlier, um, we're not quite ready yet to sort of say, yes, you know, this is this has been successful. We're, we're seeing success happening, but we've not seen it enough yet to really be confident and, and put those case studies together. But I think they will be coming very soon uh, on there as well. OK. Um, and, and Dirk, uh, do, you, do you think your various departments are ready for greater collaboration? Um, I, I think we'll have to, you know, but there is um, there's only so much um, sort of cost cutting, et cetera, that you can do um, without sort of changing the way you operate quite fundamentally. Um, and, and and that's certainly I think within the organization I work uh, in, we've, we've reached that point where we we understand we can't um, just, um, you know, keep salami slicing what we do. We need to really work in a, in a fundamentally different way. You mentioned digital earlier. Yes, that is that's clearly a part of it, um, but it's also, um, you know, about working much uh, closer with with other organisations, with with other councils, and with other organisations within our within our area, to see how we can do things better together. So. Um, and just finally, um, and really as a summary, almost of of what you've been saying this morning. Um, Time is of the essence here, really, isn't it? We saw lots of things um, catapulted, really, because of the pandemic and the, and the effect that had on, on our lives and, and the way we work and certainly on, on the way our organisations um, were, were functioning. So I just wondered how time specific this collaboration, this change needs to be when it comes to the procurement process. It, it, is, it is pretty vital now, isn't it? Michael, I'll let you first give me your response to that, please, and then Dirk. I'd be interested to hear how it looks from the council's point of view. I think the the the, the pandemic obviously hit us pretty hard, um, but I think the, the the good thing that happened with procurement, it uh, people recognised that it wasn't a basement function anymore, uh, and it came out, it stood up, uh, it did what it had to do, uh, and we've been able to sort of carry on 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 the back of that, uh, looking at how we sort of work together, support each other uh, and start having those conversations with the CFOs and, and, and other senior people in the NHS about what we can actually do and, and drive. Um, so, yeah, in, in a sort of perverse way, the pandemic uh, from from procurement perspective really helped us and, and put us on the agenda. Great. Um, uh, Dirk, what about you? Well, in terms of the, part, the time um, reference to this and and how quickly it all needs to happen how does that look from the council's point of view we, we we've got a lot of you know big challenges we've got a sort of immediate sort of cost of living crisis we've got a carbon neutral uh, you know carbon neutral uh, targets um and things we need to change there um so we've got we've got this you know so things we need to fix now um, but there's also things we need to invest in now that are we are not going to reap the benefits of in, until you know five to ten years from now, um, and um, that's a that's a challenge in the current sort of financial context. So, yeah, we need to act now. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, joined. Yeah, we have we have got another panelist who has joined us, um, and it, it is definitely. No, no, that better is. late than never, Malcolm. Nice to have you with us. Um, well, um, I'm very uh, sorry to be here, which is entirely a digital problem. I have to say to the organisers, I mean, I have a brand new iPad sitting in my bag beside me, but it won't connect into this wonderful platform. Uh, so I had to borrow from my son-in-law um, a laptop, which is so old, it's taken us an hour to connect it. So I'm grateful to my colleagues at Birmingham University, where I'm speaking to you from, for allowing me to participate. So I just caught a, a flash at the end there. So, um, no, 
we're, we're very glad to have you with us, Malcolm. We're very grateful to your son-in-law as well for, for his technology, because that's obviously helped. Well, I'm, well I think us. he's not, yes, okay. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. anyway but, next time, I will know better next time. And no, 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 not yeah. at all, honestly. It is really great to have you with us. So I just came in on the tail end of the discussion, um, yes. about where your colleagues, uh, and I say good morning to fellow panellists, were, were talking about the fact that we are absolutely rethinking public procurement not just in terms of best price, but in terms of uh, of what it can do for society, essentially. Yeah. As we would say, it's about spending public money in a smarter way. Uh, and I'm sure you've been discussing, I know you've been particularly interested in social value. Uh, my real passion is actually getting more innovative companies uh, to contribute to this process, because I think there's a whole lot of unleashed power in the economy. The government wants uh, more innovation. Uh, and we need to make public procurement much more innovation friendly. And when I was in the European Parliament um, and we, we did a huge amount of work on the, on the 2014 regulations, which we're now operating under, to encourage more innovation. And I think what people actually don't know is that the European Commission did a big study uh, about how well countries are using innovation procurement. And the UK was ranked top alongside Norway. Now, so we're already actually doing quite well in the UK, but actually there's many more things we could be doing in changing behaviour and using more innovative tools. Uh, and so we're now about to embark on a new set of post-Brexit rules. Um, and I think actually they could be doing more to encourage innovation. And I'm hoping that now they're about to start working in the House of Lords, we'll get a few voices there saying this needs to be more focused on getting innovative companies involved. So that's my sort of quick, my, my quick elevator pitch. Yep. No, no, that's great. And 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 that's um, made me think of a couple of questions. Mainly, what, what sort of things then do you want to see happen? I know you spoke about having a more innovative approach, but the changes in behaviour, what do you mean specifically? And how do you actually get that? <laughs> well, I think the absolutely crucial thing um, is for the procurement specialists uh, to be working with their strategists um, in local authorities and indeed in any public authority, you know, from the very beginning, um, and, and to encourage them actually not to be over prescriptive, but to actually think what problems you're trying to solve uh, and to say, you know, we don't necessarily want to roll over our existing way of doing things. Why don't we reach out into the marketplace? Why don't we specify uh, some broad criteria we want for delivering new solutions? Uh, and why don't we invite uh, innovative companies to, to make pitches to us and then we can choose the best ones and co-develop those solutions. Um, Innovate UK has just published a really important report uh, about the Small Business Research Initiative, which has been funding now for more than 10 years. Um, and the results of that are quite conclusive about the way that it's generated new innovations and also the companies that, that have been supported through co-developing solutions for public authorities, in many cases have gone on to develop thriving businesses, selling those solutions to other authorities. So it's not, we're thinking in procurement here, not just in terms of improving solutions, but also actually generating um, a, a thriving innovation and economy. Um, and when you think about leveling up and regional innovation centers, we really can build those around uh, an innovative procurement hub which the authority concern really makes its way known. It's known as being an innovative company, and particularly on things like zero carbon. Uh, I mean, many local authorities have declared, have emerged, have, have emer say that they've declared a public a zero carbon nice. emergency. That really needs innovative solutions. Okay. Um, I mean, I know the panelists are nodding uh, as you're speaking, but we did hear. Um, from both Michael and Dirk, um, and I'm not sure, Malcolm, if you're aware of the backgrounds, but obviously Dirk is, is coming to us from Cornwall Council, and yes, uh, yep. uh, Michael, obviously, from um, NHS. So I just yep. wondered if if they could perhaps talk to you about this, because they I know Michael mentioned a, an app, uh, an online mm -hmm. tool, sorry, that was obviously very successful. One example he gave us was something that's really worked of innovation. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not always that easy to do, is it, Michael? I know because we're talking about a huge organisation from your perspective, aren't we? And, and you can have innovative companies, but it, does it necessarily cross as quickly or perhaps as effectively as you want it to do in the way that Malcolm was talking about? Um, 
it, it doesn't always do that, but I think you know we've we've got in in the way of ourselves in terms of what we've been doing. Um, so you know we we use the OG rules, and sometimes we use them as barriers mm. to get through the rules rather than looking at, at what the outcome should be. So you know I'm really supportive of what Malcolm's saying and, and looking at yeah. what the outcomes should be, and and yeah. actually how do you use the rules to get to the outcomes that you want rather than letting the rules yeah. dictate yeah. where you're going to go. So. Um, I, you know, my, well, I encourage my team to do that a lot. We've moved a lot, uh, a lot of things away from traditional frameworks to dynamic purchase mm -hmm. systems, and that gives us a lot more flexibility. It gives us the ability to look at innovative suppliers and then bring them in uh, and, and and work with them. But it's difficult to do things at, at scale. Yeah. I mean, I, can I come? Can I? Yeah, come please on do. On? I mean, please I think, do. Uh, I would say to you actually that. The rule, I mean, all the work that I've done, uh, which has been extensive, you know, since since 2014 uh, with Connected Places and others. I mean, the rules are actually not the problem. Hmm. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the current rules allow you to do pre-market consultations yeah. um, and, and to engage suppliers earlier on uh, and to do technology scans about, uh, about areas where you might want to move forward. Um, I mean, what you have to be cautious about, actually, is, is that sometimes... Um, as you've indicated, people will use rules to stop you doing something new or different. Yeah, uh, and uh, and and I'm hoping that the 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 new proposals from the governments, which are which have opened out a whole new, are not prescribing particular categories, uh, might help to do that. Uh, the other thing I would say, by the way, I re I refer to SBRI, that SBRI programs in healthcare have been extremely successful. Um, and anybody who's interested can go onto the Innovate UK website and get hold of this report because they've got some fantastic examples about innovations that have been developed in the NHS through using the SBRI programme. Um, and I think that this is a real opportunity, actually, so it's good to have you on. Uh, and also, I think that from major authorities like Cornwall, um, which have, have the scale um, to be able to essentially make their own markets for distinctive solutions, I think this is an area we particularly want to reach out to them. So in my own region here, for example, we're working with the West Midlands Combined Authority, and we also have a research team working in Manchester, um, and both of those are designated in the levelling up agenda for innovative hubs, and we're hoping to make procurement very much part of those. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned uh, Cornwall there, and uh, it was actually Dirk's bugbear, the fact that, that uh, you could go on and complain about something to do with your local council, but you would perhaps have to log on four different times and, and talk to yeah, four yeah. different departments. So I'm, I'm going to let Dirk come back to you on that, and, and you know, because he's living that and he's seeing it happen. And as he said, it is his bugbear. Well, yes. Uh, um, and I think something you, you said, Malcolm, about um, sort of you know pitching to the market um and um you know that is that is i think where you know as local authorities we need to collaborate more because uh, uh, you know you say we've got scale in cornwall and i'm sure you're you're sort of, you know talking about us as a as an authority in the in, in the area that we're that we're sort of covering but as an organization as a client for a, for say a tech company we're just a tiny player uh, we yeah. would need yeah. to we need to really collaborate with a lot of other authorities to be able to yeah. have the cloud to be able to yeah. to say yeah. right these are the type of solutions that we're looking for you know yeah. develop yeah. something that meets our needs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, I mean I, this is a problem. I agree with you. This is a problem about partnership, but I I do think that that procurement is a mechanism for generating those partnerships. Um, so if I give you an, an interesting example here, that Birmingham, Coventry, and Wolverhampton. Are now are now at the moment working on a, a joint project to improve the environmental performance of all our social housing. Now that shows the sort of scale you could achieve. Uh, and it seems to me that the way I would work on it from the other way around, rather than say we immediately need a partnership, let's talk about where we have shared problems. Um, I mean, in health, for example, we know there are lots of shared problems that, that are probably in many cases national problems that can be solved together. And I'm sure there are issues across the Cornwall and the Cornish local authorities where you've got some shared problems that you want to tackle with new technologies. And I, I think it is potentially easier to agree on the problems you want to be solved and then move from there to develop the partnership working. So that would be the way that I would go about it. Okay, I've, I've just had a, a sign flash up saying that we've got one minute left. 
So um, sadly, that's not, not very long, but I, I just want to do a quick last question um, to all of you, really. Uh, and I, I think I did ask it, actually, of Michael and of Dirk earlier, but about success and, and, and perhaps how that would look to you in terms of the procurement mm. process and, and maximising value. Um, what, what does it look like to you, Malcolm? What, what, how would you describe that? Well, I would describe it if, if we had um, all local authorities uh, looking for opportunities to bring innovative companies um, into their into their process and and improving the ways in which they encourage companies to come to them because sometimes people there are small companies who would like to supply the private sector but find that it's quite difficult to get a good entry point. Uh, so I think that um, as potential customers, actually, we need also need to think about the best way to work with innovative companies, and if we make some progress on that. Uh, and, and our research group is looking at ways of measuring our data around this because this is part of the problem. So we don't have so very much data around this. Then I think that that would be a real advance, um, and it would mean also it would it, it would be really good for the economy if that's what happens. Well. I look forward to hearing that as a good news story very soon. So uh, for now, gentlemen, I think we're going to have to leave it there because sadly our time has run out. But uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Malcolm, thank you very much. Dirk, thank and you for, also thank Michael. You for fitting me in. Something <laughs> like that. It's really great. No, it's a pleasure. It was well worth it. So thank you all. And uh, thank you as well to our audience who did send in quite a few comments. But uh, I think a lot of them, you covered the points of anyway. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and that sadly is it for that conversation, but we have lots more great conversation heading your way throughout the day. We do now have another break and uh, uh, that should be for about uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to say at this stage. It may be a little bit shorter, so do make sure you check in, but um, do uh, spend the time obviously having a drink, a uh, cup of tea or coffee, and maybe uh, if you want to climb up the gamification leaderboard, you will have that opportunity as well. And of course, to do some uh, networking and connecting with your delegates. So thank you for now and I'll join you back uh, on here very shortly. Thank you. <laughs>